<laughs> hey everyone, thanks for tuning in this morning. I'm Nicole Forbes with Genesis 70s, and today we are talking all about attracting birds to your garden. Um, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, um, and one of my favorite things to do is just bird watching. I, uh, if you know me, you know that I am never very far from a pair of binoculars. Um, and that's not because I have poor eyesight. I like to look at uh, birds in the sky, birds in the trees, and I have recently even been trying to train my ear to recognize various bird songs so that without even looking, um, while I'm out in my garden, I can just know um, that the song sparrow is nearby or that I'm listening to chickadees um, or of course, you know, hummingbirds. So <clears throat> birds are, birds share our garden with us and really enhance our enjoyment of the landscape. And they truly show the joy um, in our gardens that, that we're trying to create in the world. So um, we do all of this work to plan and plant and landscape and maintain and cultivate these things, not only for our pleasure, um, but for, you know, the community at large, which does in many cases include our local bird population. And when you see wild creatures living and enjoying the world that you've created for them, it is incredibly gratifying. Um, and so we have seen, you know, with uh, the pandemic and even before the pandemic, uh, bird watching and kind of just birding in general is becoming a, a more popular pastime and activity that is being enjoyed by um, multi-generations, whether you are, um, you know, in the city or if you live in uh, the country or more rural areas, all uh, activity abilities um, can enjoy bird watching, and so it really is one of those um, one of those things that everyone can can enjoy. And so, <clears throat> what um, what we have seen get more and more popular in the um, in kind of the gardening community is creating habitat specifically, not only to attract birds to the garden, but to um, create an entire world for them that allows birds not only to come and visit, but to take up residence in our gardens, maybe even raise a family um, and hang out long term. And so um, a lot of habitat programs that will assist gardeners with uh, lists of plants to help them create the elements of habitat and in the end become even like certified as a habitat and, and, and sign it um, to announce to the neighborhood, announce to the community with a beautiful sign that you have a habitat that benefits the community. So this is an example of the Backyard Habitat Certification Program's sign um, that their logo, and of course this we have indicating that the Portland Plant List native plants in our native section um, are part of the Backyard Habitat program. But also on the Backyard Habitat signs includes the two groups that are the main sponsors of that program, and that's the Audubon Society as well as the Columbia Land Trust. So lots of different organizations, um, and the handout to this, blog, to this class is attached as a blog um, on the video here, but you'll see a lot of resources towards the end of the handout that mention um, websites or places to go to find out more information from these different certification programs. <clears throat> the, the, what we want to talk about today is just some of the basic elements of habitat, some of the uh, best plants that we suggest that many of them are featured right now, blooming and looking uh, excellent, and just a little bit about kind of um, best practices in uh, welcoming and keeping birds and wildlife in your garden. So before I get into the elements of habitat, um, one of the things that I like to mention, um, and again, if you know me, you know that I am, um, 
I am fond of insects. I am fond of the life cycle in the garden. And that includes all aspects of the garden from the plants to the um, soil to the insects, good and bad, that uh, hang out as well. And when we think about birds specifically in our gardens, birds eat um, seeds and fruits and berries and insects. So depending on the type of bird, uh, we want to make sure that we are offering a wide range of uh, food supply so that the menu can service as many different bird uh, varieties as possible. So having a, uh, having a healthy insect population in your garden is really part of having a balanced uh, ecosystem out in your landscape. And as you may or may not have uh, attended any of our beneficial insect classes, one of the things I always like to remind people is that uh, about in an average home garden, about 90% of the insects that are in our gardens are beneficial insects or benign insects, leaving about 10% of the bugs out there as legitimate pests. So, um, we buy you know packets of ladybugs we know that there are good bugs to fight bad bugs um we have all kinds of people come in asking for uh plants for butterflies plants for pollinators and we know that pollinators can be bees and other insects and butterflies all start out their life cycle as a caterpillar which most of us just kind of think of as a bug so it is important that we also uh, build a little bit of a habitat and respect for the insect population in our garden, which means lessening our chemical usage, uh, specifically insecticides, and practicing a little bit more of what we would call an integrated pest management program, which is starting with the least toxic controls um, before moving on to more toxic chemical controls. And that again, um, protects the other residents in your garden. So the basic elements of shelter include food, water, cover or shelter, and a place to raise your young um, or raise a family. And so um, breaking those down, we, to create the best habitat for any kind of bird in your garden, you would need to hit on all of those elements. So you would need to provide not only food and water, but consider shelter and cover, which is important to make a bird feel safe. And if you want them, as I mentioned, to not just come and go, but actually live in your garden, having a place to raise their young, um, a, a place to lay a nest um, or you know have a um, brood is the, is the most secure way of having you know a constant bird population in your yard so food is pretty easy most of us think well i have i have food for a bird um i've got a bird feeder and i fill it with seed so that is um that's a great start to creating a, a garden that attracts birds but as you start looking even at bird seed and different bird feeders this bird feeder specifically says that it is best for chickadees and goldfinches so it's really specific to basically two kinds of birds that like to feed off of this kind of bird feeder so not only does a bird feeder <clears throat> in its shape or its construction kind of um, already start to select the types of birds that are more likely to visit it but then the seed that we fill that bird feeder with <clears throat> will have a seed content that first of all favors only birds that eat bird seed. I mean, that's pretty obvious. And not all birds eat bird seed or seed in general. So we are selecting down to the types of birds that eat the seed that is in our seed mix. When we landscape to attract birds or offer a complete habitat that includes the seed that often is found in our bird seed uh, bags and feeders, but seed is also found in the 
flower heads of ornamental grasses. And this flower head is just at the point where its little seeds, there one fell off. So its little seeds are ripening and able to be picked off and gobbled up by a little bird. And these seeds are full of protein. Now some of the flowers on the grass are not yet ripe and haven't opened yet, but some have even already been uh, feasted on and are just down to kind of a bare structure where the seeds have been removed. So even something like an ornamental grass offers seed for our area birds to enjoy. Nectar from flowers and blooming flowers is critical for, of course, nectar feeders like our hummingbirds. Insects, as I also mentioned, and then fruits and berries for the um, berry eaters or the fruit eaters that uh, sometimes also are uh, seed eaters as well. Second aspect of habitat is water, and water can be a, a real critical element of habitat. As many people find it easy and convenient to put a bird feeder out, it's not quite as convenient to have water available in your garden. Um, it could be as simple as a bird bath, um, but it is important that anything like standing water, like a bird bath, is kept fresh and clean with fresh water um, and algae kind of scrubbed out of it on a regular basis um, so that there are no um, harmful things that build up in the water. But it is more attractive to birds to have a little bit of movement in the water. So uh, a bubbling fountain, a water feature, a um, even a little uh, like aquarium pump added into the bottom of a bird bath that just moves the water some will show uh, from a distance and will really get the attention of birds as they're, they're flying by because it kind of shimmers in the light. Um, and if you don't have a bird bath or any other kind of water feature, even just running uh, one of the old school sprinklers that you know goes back and forth in an arching pattern as the area or surrounding shrubs get wet, you know, wet with water and begin dripping, you will probably notice little birds, especially a hot summer day, little birds start coming in and closer to that sprinkler. And you might even see a hummingbird fly straight through the stream of water, uh, taking advantage of that and getting a little shower as well. So a sprinkler can even be water for birds. And then cover or shelter, the third aspect of habitat, that includes um, places where birds can um, flee to if they are at the bird feeder, if they are at the uh, bird bath, for example, they can quickly fly to an adjacent shrub or tree to gain shelter. And uh, that could be if a larger predator bird comes, if uh, an area cat, you know, may be stalking them nearby, they have the safety to fly into shelter, uh, that's going to, again, make the bird feel more comfortable and more likely to visit that space in the first place. Um, so think thickets and hedges, dense shrubs, even rock piles, brush piles, of course, bird houses, um, and then just conifers or evergreens in general provide a lot of um, shelter or opportunity for shelter. Near my um, fountain, where I get a lot of birds, I have, oh, I have one of my favorite shelter plants for birds, and this is a barberry. Um, now this is orange rocket barberry. It is just taking on some beautiful colors this time of year, but um, barberry is gonna drop its leaves in the winter. It has, um, hasn't quite developed its berries yet, but it has a really tiny, uh, seed or berry that shows up inside the plant, kind of a bright orange red that birds enjoy. And it's also full of thorns. Um, so it has sharp thorns or prickles all over the stems, which basically creates um, a protective space for birds to flee to when the um, cat that hangs out in my yard, you know, decides that he's gonna go after the birds, they can fly straight into the barberry bush and the cat's not going in there after them. So it's a nice protective space that creates that, um, that safety to flee to. And it doesn't have to be something with thorns, but again, barberry makes a great shelter. Um, 
for me and I find the birds go straight to it. Now the last element of habitat is a place to raise young. Um, this is not critical to having birds live uh, visiting your garden, but like I said, for permanent residents, um, you know, most permanent residents are going to think about having a family at some point. So whether or not you're providing all of those elements to keep a bird and a bird family there um, that includes trees or again, large dense shrubs, tall grasses, dead branches or stumps of trees, a pond, a nesting box, and in reality, many of the very same landscape elements that provide shelter or cover can also provide a place to raise young. So these can, many, in many cases, they're dual purpose. The, um, the layered landscape is important, again, to create that safe approach for birds to come into your landscape. So if you really think about or if you observe birds in your garden or in, in any kind of landscape, um, First of all, birds don't hang out on the ground. Um, in most cases with us, they are flying from point A to point B in the sky. And the, the uh, act of coming lower and lower to the ground is, um, is a, first of all, it's a danger act, um, but they have to do it to get their food. So in order to have a safe approach, Birds are going to come from the sky, ideally to a tall upper story tree that allows them to survey the neighborhood, find the best place. Is it your yard? Is it someone else's yard? Hopefully it's your yard, but they're checking from high up to see which garden has the best place to visit. Then the next layer down, they may come into some of our um, taller shrubbery, or uh, shorter, smaller shade trees as that kind of understory tree canopy to be in your yard for the first time. And now that they've chosen to come into your landscape, this understory or shorter canopy uh, vantage point allows them not only to determine their flight path to their destination, whether it's to the food supply, whether it's to the water supply, but to also check for danger, um, if there is another bird nearby, if there is a lurking predator, again, like a neighborhood cat, they will be able to see it from a distance um, and maybe wait for a better opportunity to fly to that uh, source. Then, of course, they still take yet one more step in most cases, where the bird flies from that upper canopy to a nearby branch or shrub before making the final approach to the food source or the water source. So having those upper canopy, lower canopy, uh, low tiered shrubs, and then your supply, uh, you know, that lures them in is the safest approach and makes the birds feel the most comfortable. So um, again, think about not just a single level landscape, but building those tiers. Having a garden that is for lack of a better term, a little on the messy side is also more uh, appropriate for fostering habitat. So messy is just another way of saying more natural. Um, this time of year, here we are, early November, a lot of people start thinking about garden cleanup, winter preparation, or sometimes I say putting the garden to bed for winter and and there's kind of two different practices in in regards to that many of us <clears throat> will um, you know reduce damage um, by you know removing things that might have been diseased or uh, eliminating uh, plant material that may spread disease or rot um, but trying to leave as much plant material up if it has something to offer to area birds and wildlife as we possibly can. So that goes back to like our little ornamental grass. And in our uh, ornamental grass class that we had a few weeks ago, we talked about the options when it comes to um, 
grass maintenance. I mean, so this is a maiden grass. This is a variety called, uh, is this Yakujima? Yes, this is Yakujima. So normally this grass is green with a little bit of a silver accent down the middle, but right now it's all colors of peach and apricot. There's a little bit of green. There's a bit of purple kind of burgundy to it. So it's in the kind of peak of its fall color, but it's going to turn um, kind of a golden straw color for winter. But at the moment, not only do we have seed heads ripe, but we have seeds still ripening on the plant. If we come out to do garden cleanup today and chop this down, not only would, would we be missing out on, you know, still another six weeks or so of kind of fall transition as it changes colors, but we would also be basically closing the restaurant early uh, on all of our birds that would be coming to feed off of these seed heads. So garden cleanup, to a minimum, um, the more you cut everything back, rake everything away, and send it packing to the yard debris bin, the chances that you raked up butterfly caterpillar, caterpillar larva or overwintering helpful ladybug populations or beetles that would be feeding the you know ground foraging birds in the future all of those things are accidentally caught up in the debris that we you know are trying to clean up and leave our gardens um, for winter if we have that cleanup attitude so um, obviously <clears throat> you don't have to have a garden that looks like nobody lives there um, or an abandoned home but <clears throat> choosing areas that maybe uh, you can leave slightly more wild towards the perimeter. Um, rake leaves into a pile in the back corner of your garden or allow a dead stump or a dead branch to decay in a you know slightly unseen area in your yard will provide habitat without um, being so unsightly maybe if that's not um, you know your idea of the garden aesthetic that you want to bring. It is um, It is really listy um, to just kind of go through, you know, trees and shrubs and whatnot for food and shelter. Uh, I just, you know, I definitely want you to know that we have uh, a lot of plants listed out on the handout and quite a few of them, you'll see an asterisk next to the plant name. That all indicates that those plants are available as a native plant. Um, so, you know, the crab apple or dogwood that we mentioned has also got a native form of dogwood or native crab apple that you could provide um, instead of a cultivar. But I want to, first of all, highlight a couple of plants that I brought up um, today because just as it is important that we are providing food sources throughout the season, it's also important that we have something in bloom throughout the season um, to feed our hummingbird. So not only do we have songbirds, um, raptors, we have birds coming from you know Canada on their way south. The, the Portland metro area actually sits in a critical flyway that is a migration pattern from north-south. So as you'll see on your handout, um, and if you, you know, live in the Portland metro area, some of the um, wetland areas that we have naturally preserved uh, around here include Savi Island um, and the Smith and Bybee lakes and wetland area. Um, those are extremely important winter migration uh, spaces for overwintering birds or migrate migratory birds on their way north or south um, as just a place to like grab a bite, take a break, um, think of it as like bed and breakfast um, for the avian, po avian population. So not only is it important for us to offer native plants to provide native food supply for our native bird population, but because we have migratory birds passing through, it is also reasonable to offer an international uh, cuisine because we do have um, visitors coming with different appetites and um, preferences. 
So you can provide ornamentals as well as natives in your garden um, and see that, again, you have a wide variety of birds that come and visit. Now, uh, hummingbirds is one of the birds that we all love to talk about, and really all of us love to um, watch hummingbirds in the garden, although they're one of the hardest birds to watch in the garden unless they're at a feeder because they're so darn fast. But hummingbirds, uh, traditionally, when they have all flowers in the summer to choose from, show their preference to a tubular flower that is usually orange or pink or red, and they'll favor those flowers visiting more frequently or more uh, religiously than other flowers. But as the, as the flowers become fewer and further between towards this time of year, they can't have such picky uh, appetites. And so even our hummingbirds will kind of relax their preferences and find that any flower blooming uh, is better than no flowers at all. And so um, they come and visit uh, even something that is as non-tubular uh, as a camellia. And so um, really this time of year, there are a few things still blooming out in the landscape, but one of the things that is coming into bloom and will now be flowering for at least the next six, uh, eight or even more weeks are varieties of Sisenko camellias and their hybrids. So this is the Yuletide camellia, which is, you know, classic red flower with a lovely yellow center. And the nectar and pollen that's provided in this yellow center is protein rich. So a lot of uh, energy comes from visiting this plant when the hummingbird stops by and drinks a little bit of nectar and gets some pollen. But the Yuletide camellia also has, a, Yuletide is a tall camellia, 8 to 12 feet tall and even wide. Uh, but this camellia here is, I think this is, this isn't Jean May, this is Chansonette. Chansonette. So Chansonette is a little double pink camellia that is actually a lower grower. So 2 to 3 feet tall, but a spreader, so it could get 6 to 8 feet wide. Now, these are evergreen, they are winter blooming and um, slow to moderate growers. These varieties of camellias prefer to be in partial sun. Uh, they can even take some direct sun. The deeper and deeper into shade, they won't bloom terrifically for you. So a little bit different than our spring blooming camellias. And uh, when it comes to berries, You'll see on your list, there's tons of berries to choose from. Um, and we've got, you know, pyracantha and cotoneaster, the lovely berries of uh, Oregon grape right now. We have our huckleberry, our native huckleberry. Salal here is a fantastic native ground cover that makes an edible and nutritious berry as well as a flower that honeybees like. And beauty berry, which Let's see, this is a broken stem of beauty berry to show the gorgeous purple berries that it creates. So beauty berry is a berry that is very colorful this time of year, makes a wonderful cut display in uh, flower arrangements or table center pieces. And when the beauty berry outside has been frosted on a couple of times, the purple color will start to fade. So right around Christmas or even later, the purple color will fade, the berry will become a little bit more translucent, and that frost on the berry raises its sugar content inside the berry. And at that point is when the birds uh, come in and eat it. So they don't tend to go after the berries when they're this beautiful bright color, which is what I like to see, and then they wait until it's kind of lost its color. Uh, at the same time, it's got a little bit sweeter for them, and then they um, come in and gobble it up. So fun for, um, <coughs> fun in how we share um, the, the berries, the birds and I. Um, Oregon grape, <clears throat> as I mentioned, is another native that not only makes an edible uh, berry cluster or fruit cluster, but it also has a, Early, late winter, early spring flower that hummingbirds will go after too. It's a little yellow bloom. And 
at the uh, garden centers, not only uh, have we been provided through the Backyard Habitat um, program, we have the Portland plant list, which is basically the native plants um, suggested by plant communities. So um, it's a pretty extensive book and anybody that's in the Backyard Habitat program is provided a copy of the Portland plant list. Um, but we also have it on, uh, on hand for reference at the garden centers. And we also <clears throat> often have a really handy uh, information piece that's provided through Metro uh, that the garden centers partner with to get out into the community. This native plants uh, for Limit Valley Yards brochure. And of course, on the cover is not only our lovely Anna's Hummingbird, but the flower that it's drinking off of is one of my favorite native shrubs called a red flowering currant. Ribes sanguinium, or red flowering currant, is a late winter, early spring bloomer. Um, and right now it has dropped most of its leaves, so I didn't bring it in to show off. But if you see what the inside of this brochure looks like, it gives us a nice photo, brief description of the plants, and then, um, kind of icons that'll indicate whether it's songbirds or pollinators, uh, the different water needs, and all of that, of course, is referenced in a little key up front. So um, this is just a handy guide that if you come and stop into most of the garden centers, we should have copies available for you. Uh, 30, it's about 50 pages, including the glossary. Um, so again, uh, just a nice guide for getting you started on which plants offer um, food and resources for our area birds and a little bit of information beyond that. Um, last thing I want to mention uh, is <clears throat> that often when you garden to attract birds, whether it is um, keeping a seed feeder or running, you know, filling your uh, hummingbird feeder. In many cases, we find that there are um, some negative side effects that come along with them. So um, just seed feeding on its own. Uh, first of all, some birds will come and throw seed out of the feeder all over the ground. Um, well, there are birds that prefer to be ground feeders, um, and at least they would prefer to, to feed in an open tray that they can just hop around and kind of scratch around in. So as they get this uh, confined tray or cylinder, they wanna scatter the seed out on the ground so that then they can hop around and feed in a more um, comfortable fashion for themselves. Now those messy scattering birds will scatter seed around that often then does not get fully eaten. Some of that seed will sprout and create some weeds or you'll grow a little layer of grass like lawn underneath your bird feeder. Um, so that in itself we hear people complain about. Some bird seed is the no mess bird seed that doesn't have the, um, doesn't have the, the seed outside itself that they've all been cracked and that's supposed to also keep birds from scattering them. Some birds don't even like the no mess um, bird seed, so that's not always the answer. But um, keeping that area underneath the bird seed, bird feeder clear or just using a kind of a regular, you know, cultivating underneath it or a mulch that makes it easy to pull those weed seeds out will keep them from becoming a big problem. Seed that falls on the ground often also becomes a, an attractant to area slugs. So sometimes I find a lot of slugs hanging out underneath my bird feeders. It's definitely an area that on purpose, I put some slug bait out. We use Sluggo, which is a non-toxic slug bait that is safe for birds and wildlife. So I just put a little bit extra out around the bird feeder where the seed falls and that kind of gets the slugs there. The worst thing that I have seen attracted to the messy seed in my bird feeder is rats. Um, and so again, um, if that becomes an issue for you, if rats 
are attracted to bird seed and bird seed becomes a mess. You can still feed birds um, and instead you can feed suet, which is a little bit cleaner and hangs usually in a cage from either a hook, a shepherd's hook or a tree and is a lot harder um, you know, to fall, it doesn't fall on the ground and create quite as much of a mess, won't cause weed seeds to sprout and it usually doesn't lure um, the same amount of rodent traffic. Now, um, suet though is, uh, rats with long furry tails, also known as squirrels, um, will get to your bird, cedar, bird seed feeder and they will do their best to get to your suet feeders as well. So um, there, if squirrels are an issue, again, there are different ways to overcome that. Um, talking to folks, the super knowledgeable and helpful folks at the Backyard Bird Shop, they often will recommend a seed that has a bird seed blend that has cayenne pepper in it. Um, what's interesting is I guess birds have no um, hot spicy taste buds, so they don't mind eating bird seed covered in cayenne pepper, but squirrels do. Um, so squirrels will leave the bird seed alone um, if it's dusted in pepper. And some um, suets also will have hot pepper or pepper in the suet as well, which doesn't bother the birds, but the squirrels won't go after them. Um, squirrels have become, some, some years it seems squirrels are bigger issues than others. It does seem like this has been a big uh, squirrel year. So uh, even here uh, at the Lake Oswego store, we have um, gained a couple of chipmunks that are living in our building. And so, you know, I realize that it uh, sometimes can um, become a little bit of an issue and you need to, to address that. But one of the other um, kind of unwelcome birds that comes to my feeders and specifically to my suet are starlings, European starlings. And I'll just leave you with this. You can always learn a little bit about both your friends and your enemies, um, which can bolster your ability to either make those friends or um, avoid those enemies. And what I have learned about European starlings uh, is, first of all, they're that kind of bossy bird that they make a mess, they, uh, sometimes they're called cowbirds as well, I think, but um, they're not the most welcome bird in many gardens. And they come and they eat all the suet, and then like when a chickadee comes, there's nothing for a chickadee to eat, which makes me so mad. So what I have found is that starlings, um, they can eat while hanging upside down. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, some birds are literally meant to eat while hanging upside down. Um, I think a nuthatch is one specifically. So the um, easy way to combat that, tons of birds can eat upside down, just not the dumb starling. If you take your suet cage, which normally has a chain and a hook, and it's meant to hang kind of vertically like so, and the suet is inside of it, so birds can kind of land on the cage and, and peck at the suet, you just take this hook and hanger, and instead of hanging it like so, just unbend it with some pliers, and change the hook to the top of the cage, and hang the cage horizontally instead. And then the last step that you need to do is you need to keep the starling from being able to land on the top of the cage and just pecking through. So you take like a, a aluminum pie pan or something disposable like that. You can poke a little hole through an, a, a tin pipe pan and thread that through the chain and just put the top of the pie pan over the suet cage. All of the acrobatic birds can still access your suet from the underside and the starlings will stand on top of the pie, pit, pie tin not uh, understanding why they can't get something to eat. So um, you will have outsmarted a starling um, and that's that's a win right there. So um, I'm gonna leave it at that. If there are questions, uh, feel free to ask them in the comment section and I will answer them afterwards. And as always, I hope that you enjoyed today's class and learned a little something. Uh, until we see you again, happy gardening.